I'm very excited for our next speaker. I used to, I did a lot of work at the Federal Communications Commission uh, in a prior, prior life. And one of the things that everyone would whisper every once in a while is, everything would be different if we had software-defined radio. And so I'm excited that there's a presentation about software-defined radio to explain how everything will be different now that we have it. <laughs> uh, thanks so much. Uh, let me see. Okay, this is working great. Uh, so thanks very much. Uh, my name is Robin Getz. I'm with Analog Devices. Uh, I'm an engineer there. Uh, for those people who are, is anybody not familiar with Analog Devices? A, a couple of people? Software people. Um, sorry. <laughs> so uh, Analog Devices is a semiconductor company. We've been around since 1965. We're actually located just north of the Boston area. Uh, that's our largest uh, engineering facility in Wilmington. We have about 15,000 employees and 125,000 different customers, and we make uh, plenty of different chips. And uh, we also do um, a lot of open source hardware ourselves, including a SDR thing that I'll talk about. And you know, a lot of the reasons that we do open source hardware is because um, you know, our customers, which are also everybody in this room, as well as uh, large consumer companies and aerospace defense companies and everybody else, um, they don't immediately go to a schematic. They start playing with things. They want to see how it works. They want to prototype. They want to tinker. And when they do that, they want to do it on Arduino. They want to do it on a Raspberry Pi. They want to do it on BeagleBoard. So we actually make platforms like that that connect into that kind of um, ecosystem uh, and go all the way up the stack. So we actually work with GNU Radio and develop GNU Radio pieces and do a lot of Linux kernel device drivers and a lot of other things as well. Uh, including uh, LT Spice, which is an analog circuit simulator. Uh, we also work with a lot of education pieces, so a lot of outreach. Um, we have an active learning program, which does um, both circuit pieces with uh, uh, parts kits, like here, where you know students can go buy things and get R's and C's and op amps and power and uh, various different things as well as we are a big supporter of FIRST, and then have a uh, software-defined radio, which is this uh, Pluto device. So for those people who are unfamiliar with uh, software-defined radio, this is how um, Wikipedia defines it. And almost everything that is a radio today is somewhat software-defined. So your cell phone is actually, there's large portions of the cellular stack that run all in software. There's large portions of the cellular stack that run in hardware. Um, both in terms of uh, acceleration engines and those kinds of things. But then there are a lot of other things like uh, walkie-talkies or man-pack radios or UAVs or uh, a variety of different things um, actually are all software-defined. So this little um, uh, piece, let me just, uh, pointer options, no, laser pointer. This piece right here, um, is actually going into uh, locomotive engines. And what that's for is actually to monitor the train engineer so that you can tell when he's on his cell phone or not. Because most of the accidents in the US are now actually, especially on trains, because you don't have to steer a train, are basically caused by um, operator distraction. And so they're actually putting sophisticated electronics, sophisticated SDRs just to monitor the train engineer's cell phone. And then the, the liability falls off the train company and goes on to that uh, driver or the train engineer, which is the train engineers know uh, so they don't pick their cell phone. So um, one of the newer learning kits from ADI is this Pluto device. Um, this is in my hand right here. So it is open source, open source hardware, which would include the schematics and the Gerbers. Um, we, unfortunately, we don't do things in KiCad, uh, but uh, the schematics are open source in uh, Allegro. Uh, the firmware is open source, which would include the FPGA, HDL, all the software that goes inside the device. The host software is mostly open source, and I say mostly because we interface with MATLAB, and, and MATLAB's not open source, but the different pieces that we've made are actually open and all up on GitHub. Uh, so what this really does is it captures IQ samples from the antennas and does either local processing on the unit, because it does actually run Linux, or transmits that to the PC, and you can do processing there. And uh, you know it, run, it does run Linux inside the device, so it's about a, a single core ARM. It's about the same processing performance as a Raspberry Pi Zero. So for those people familiar, you can run um, Dump 1090, 
which is an ADS-B um, application. So every airplane that flies has to transmit the tail feathers, their latitude, longitude, altitude, and their velocity and um, uh, vector in terms of uh, where they're flying. And by 2020, every single drone will have to do that as well. And you can basically track those things with this device and run all the software to decode it actually on the device itself. So it's very cross-platform, Windows, Linux, Mac, and it uses a stack inside the Linux kernel um, called IIO, which is the Industrial Input-Output Framework, to actually expose this device locally on the, the system, as well as remote over USB or Ethernet or a variety of different connectivity pieces. Um, so you can do processing remote, processing local. When you plug this into your PC over USB, it shows up as a native I.O. device, as serial, as Ethernet, as mass storage, and DFU. Um, so native I.O. over USB is to get the, the IQ data across the radio data to your, to your laptop or your desktop. A serial is so that you can actually log into the device. We are running a, uh, uh, a Linux machine on here, so you can log in, to, just like console, log in as root, and the password is analog. Ethernet is a great way to SSH and SCP over files back and forth to test things out. Um, uh, mass storage, you plug this in, it shows up as hard drive on your laptop, and that's how actually we upgrade the firmware. You can take the firmware image and just drop it onto the mass storage device. That's where all of our documentation exists. That's where all of our license files exist, is on the mass storage device itself. So it's super easy to use. Um, and this is all built from the standard Linux uh, gadget USB drivers. Um, and then if you load a image up on here that doesn't boot for some reason, because we want to make it hackable and extensible, if it, the Linux image doesn't boot, it'll boot into a recovery mode called DFU, which is a separate USB device class, for, which basically turns this into a firmware programmer. And then you get to reprogram the uh, flash that's on here. And that's a standard feature in U-Boot, the, uh, the second stage bootloader that we use. So this does run bedded Linux. We can see up on the screen. Oh, we can see up on the screen it actually booting Linux. Or not. Anyway, it, uh, it, it does run Linux. And uh, it takes about two seconds to boot. There's, um, uh, oops, no, I just got all confused, sorry. It is uh, cross-platform. Maybe. Uh, it runs the 414 LTS kernel, so it's actually a fairly recent kernel. Um, it's all build root and busy box. It has about a two second boot time, uh, 32 meg of serial flash on here and 512 meg of DDR. Um, there is a small button on here that we typically use to um, if you push the button and power it on, then it comes up in a programming mode if, if you want to recover something. People repurpose that button. They'll uh, power this from a um, uh, battery that is normally used to charge your phone. And then they'll walk around with a USB thumb drive hanging off the end. And every time they want to record an RF signal, um, they can basically covertly push the button. And it'll record a second of information and store it on the thumb drive. And it's a great way to do um, kind of covert wireless surveys so you don't have to um, drive around in your boat, you know, a mile offshore. <laughs> uh, so it is open source firmware. All the firmware is up on GitHub, and that would include like the HDL, the Linux kernel, all of user space, BusyBox, uh, the Xilinx first stage bootloader. Um, it's built up as a, a multi-function or a, a multi-repository GitHub. So when you say git checkout, it'll clone all the different pieces for you. And you type make, it'll actually build everything for you in one step, assuming you have the Xilinx tools installed correctly. Uh, this does actually build with Webpack, which is not open, but is zero cost. Um, and it, it basically will uh, give you these files that you can just basically throw on the mass storage device and then uh, upgrade. It, it is cross-platform, so this is it running on Windows. Let me see. Sorry, bear me with you one second. There we go. Now it's working. Okay, so it actually boots up and you can SSH into it with PuTTY. Um, so every time the device boots, it actually generates a different um, SSH key from, busy, or, uh, from uh, Drop Air, 
which then provides a warning and you can cat uh, proc CPU info and see what kind of machine you're on. Um, and, uh, you know, this has a single core ARM. Uh, so there's basically a single, for those people who are aware, it's a single core zinc that's inside here, 7010. And we can uh, actually use the putty to get a serial um, to the same device. And we can just go into COM uh, on this machine, COM 5, 45, and log in as root and analog and kind of go from there. Uh, it can be used, like I said before, uh, into a mass or into a, a host. So that could be Linux, Windows, Mac, um, your embedded Linux target like a Raspberry Pi or BeagleWord. Uh, thumb drives, because it supports on the go, uh, USB LAN, USB Wi-Fi. So those are plug right into here and we support all the common um, dongles that are actually supported with Raspberry Pi in the default image. Uh, one of the things we don't support by uh, building up is actually supporting uh, USB audio. So you can actually like decode FM or listen to FM radio, do these kinds of things right on the device. Uh, we support GNU radio. So this is actually uh, uh, an application called Phosphor where it basically shows a waterfall and what that waterfall is is just the, uh, the amplitude of that signal of that instant of instant in time and then that instant in time falls down the screen and you can kind of recreate whatever you want depending on what you're uh, broadcasting. Uh, when I was doing this I was broadcasting with a SMA cable not with antennas because uh, this has a tendency to take on Wi-Fi. Uh, SDR Angel is another great open source application. Uh, you know, it's Windows, it's Linux, it's all based on uh, Qt and OpenGL, and it has a lot of uh, decoders built into it. It's great for starting out. For those people who are more interested in MATLAB, you can uh, do that. Um, there's books that are also available. Uh, with the books, the, 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 the one book that I was involved in writing is actually available for free, uh, featured on Hackaday. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is like, if you don't like math, this book may not be for you because it is a digital communications book. Uh, the documentations are all online, but all, like every open source hardware project, everybody needs more documentation, so if you're interested in helping, let it know. Uh, all the support model is online. Everything is up on GitHub or the Analog Devices Wiki. Support is on our engineers' own forums. People have taken this design, so a company in Chicago named Epic, they've actually turned uh, it into a commercial product. And so this is actually very, very close schematically to the Pluto with the addition of some RF pieces that make it a little bit more uh, rugged and industrial. And then they can actually take this and use our HDL, use our software, and um, not have to create everything themselves. So people are absolutely leveraging open source, leveraging open hardware, these kinds of things in their commercial design. The piece that I'd like to talk about too is like test, uh, which is typically the missing part of open source hardware. So we actually developed a test jig for the Pluto device, which was a um, fairly large uh, quad site tester. So you put four PCBs in it, you close the top of it. Uh, when you close the top of it, these uh, bit of the PCBs would be held in place. These, the bit of nails would basically lift up, these pogo pins. And then underneath was uh, four Raspberry Pis, uh, all running open, uh, or, uh, open OCD so that we could program JTAG and test with the device and test the USBs and all the, a variety of these kinds of pieces. It was all networked so that it could communicate back to GitHub and post test results and send us emails and we could remote into it and you know, debug it when it was on the factory floor. Um, at, at least that was our uh, perception before we actually shipped it to China. Uh, so one of the issues that we had with this was actually um, the bushings that we put in that big uh, piece of plastic were put in with a uh, three-ton press, but uh, during the uh, repeated up-downs in the factory, the bushing actually came out and started binding, which basically made that uh, white thing at the bottom uh, not come up flat, and then the pogo pin on one side would never come up to the devices. And, uh, you know, so we learned a lot. We actually went to China, uh, saw how things were working. Uh, what we had was a unit that provided very nice, simple instructions. It was a red light, green light test. So red light boards are bad, green boards were good, and that was awesome. But it didn't provide any other feedback than that. So when somebody needed to take a bad board and find out what was wrong with it, there was no real way for them to do that. Um, and, uh, you know, what we found out was that the, the, the systems that we built, whereas we could buy, them, buy all the component pieces in Europe and buy all the component pieces in 
um, the U.S., the component pieces were actually harder to find in China. Uh, so for the next test fixture we built, uh, we actually sourced it all from China. Um, and uh, we actually, you know, in terms of lessons learned when you go to China, when you have all these boards sitting around, there's lots of different things. Um, one of the things we didn't think about was actually using formal coating or basically covering our test jigs with plastic because the factories are super hot and super humid and uh, we actually had issues with um, the PCBs because they weren't cleaned as thoroughly as they should actually corroding and sticking on or sticking off, that kind of an idea. Um, you know, ensuring that uh, the test jigs are there and we have uh, backups. Um, and so I think like test is actually a super important thing that many people doing open source hardware don't necessarily think about. Uh, because it's fun to make one, it's a different thing when you're trying to make a thousand a month or five thousand a month. And uh, it's uh, super important to be able to do that. And one of the things that we learned too is uh, reusing things between products is also super good. Um, and uh, when you do go to China, especially uh, Shenzhen and different pieces of Shenzhen, it's always good to have somebody who can speak uh, native um, the language. Um, and then from a software standpoint, uh, one of the things we learned as well was when you're out on the factory floor, uh, the factory floor doesn't usually have Ethernet on it or available Wi-Fi or these kinds of things, things that you would take for granted here that's just not possible there. Um, so we built up a system that's basically a store and forward where all the test results would store on an SD card and kind of go from there. Um, and this is kind of what the test jigs look now. So they're all built in China with local parts. Uh, Seed Studios actually facilitated this. They're actually local to Shenzhen. Um, one of the things that we saw in the test flow before was our test jig in the past would actually uh, print a sticker out. It would go on the back of the box to tell you the serial number and the MAC address and these kinds of things. Um, but that's not the way they actually built them. They would uh, build and test 5,000, and then they had a second station somewhere else. They would actually like assemble them in the plastic boxes, and there was no way to keep the stickers and the, uh, the actual PCBs with the MAC addresses on them actually like uh, synchronized. So we have made a separate station to print out um, the, uh, the stickers. Just with, I think it's just a Raspberry Pi running uh, um, G label. And we've done this for other test jigs, so some more sophisticated things like our um, analog kits, which are, uh, you know, oscilloscope function generator, which need to be, like, tuned. Uh, they're actually connected up to, like, netbooks. Uh, and then we have, like, FIDI parts, which are doing, like, JTAG and SPI and GPIOs and those kinds of things to test everything. And when it comes to tuning capacitors with screwdrivers and those kinds of things, that's all actually done from the GUI on the laptop, and it makes it uh, much easier. Um, so if you do have any questions about the kits or things, I'll definitely be around uh, the rest of the day and uh, feel free to grab me. So thanks very much.